Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. I'm going to continue now where we left off yesterday on the broadcast in the book The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. What we have is a succession of events in the United States of America during the mid to latter 1800s in preparation for the proclamation of papal infallibility. We have the syllabus and uh, we have the encyclical by Pope Pius IX and the syllabus of error of 1864, which lays forth the papacy's opinion about the free institutions of the United States, this republican form of government where the people have the power and the government responds to the will of the people. He damned that as a pestilential error. Why? Because it usurped his so-called divine right authority to rule over every government, that every government of the world should serve and obey the papacy, and that every government thus seated by the papacy would then rule over the people on behest of the pope. Okay? Top-down hierarchical government is what the papacy is all about. As the divine right ruler of the world, as the vicar and replacement of Christ on earth, he arrogates to himself the power of Christ, and that is to rule over the people. And that's his perception of Christ, anyway, that he should rule over the people like a tyrant. And that the governments of the world are responsible to him. He is not responsible to them. That is the thesis that set forth in the Encyclical and Syllabus of Error of 1864 by Pope Pius IX, the biblical and historical, or one of the successors of the biblical and historical Antichrist, the papacy. Now, in further preparation as a response, we have Brownson's essays, which lays forth the thesis that no government is legitimate until it answers to God's law. Sounds good, right? Except in Brownson's view, to obey God's law means to obey the Pope. That to have an ecclesiastical government, that government must be subservient to the papacy. Amazing come, coming from a one-time Protestant and converter to the Roman Catholic cult. But that's what happened, and it was all published in the most prestigious Roman Catholic periodical of the time, the Catholic world. And it was simply to prepare the Roman Catholic laity to accept a change in the papal governmental structure that would soon surface in 1870 at the First Vatican Council, that is, the proclamation that the Pope is infallible. And that makes him... Well, that literally proves that he is God's representative. I mean, look, if you're going to represent the, the creator of all heaven and earth, you have to have some qualifying characteristic, don't you? Well, that's papal infallibility. If you want the world to obey your every whim, then you must have some something to back it up. And that was papal infallibility. All the power was stripped from the Roman Catholic hierarchy and given to the Pope. And as Eric John Phelps alludes so eloquently, that it was the Jesuits behind the whole thing to consolidate power in the Roman Catholic Church into one man to make it much, much easier for the Jesuits to control the papacy. And this has been in the works for a long time. But we have to, the Roman Catholic Church has to sell this idea in a Protestant nation. It's going to be a tough sell, but because of the acquiescence and the silent acceptance of this decree of papal infallibility, it became generally accepted even among the Roman Catholics with no fear of religious reprisals from the Protestant world. Now, first of all, after making all of these 
godlike claims over the governments, the popular republic governments in the world, the Pope had to know how he, he was, his decrees were being reacted to. He had to stick his finger in the wind to find out which way the wind was blowing. Are the people going to buy this idea that the Pope is infallible and that he is responsible for seating all the governments of the world? At first, he needed to know if the American Roman Catholic hierarchy were on his side. And so in response, and get the date here, and this is 19, uh, 1866, only two years after the publication of Pope Pius IX's encyclical and syllabus of error, the second national... And by the way, if you're following along in your book, we're reading the first full paragraph on page 43, about halfway down the page... In response to the Pope's encyclical and syllabus of error of 1864, after having about two years to analyze it and to dissect it and to understand it, what the Pope was really saying in that encyclical was that it was, every, it was the duty of every Roman Catholic in all the republics in the world those, those governments that were seated by the people and not the Pope must be overthrown. That's the inherent message of the encyclical and syllabus of error of 1864. Now, the American Roman Catholic hierarchy is going to, uh, is going to respond to this. And here's what happened. It says the Second National Council of the Roman Catholic Hierarchy of the United States met at Baltimore in October of 1866, nearly two years after the encyclical and syllabus was issued. Now, before I continue, I want to remind my listeners that Baltimore is in the colony known as Maryland. It was the only Roman Catholic colony in the colonial period. And it was Baltimore where John Carroll, the Jesuit priest, got his first, got, the United States got its first Roman Catholic archbishopric. And John Carroll was its first, the Jesuit priest, John Carroll, was its first archbishop. Now, John Carroll was a very, very powerful and influential Jesuit priest in this country, and the entire Carroll family was very instrumental even in the foundation of our government. Even they don't, the, the Carroll family donated the land for what, for what sits uh, where the, uh, the capital of the United States sits. And John Carroll was the founder of the first Jesuit college in this country. Uh, Georgetown University. Very, very powerful. So Baltimore represents here the very start of Roman Catholicism in the United States of America. And we learned all these things. If you recall, if you're a regular listener, we learned all these things from a Roman Catholic book. It was written by a Roman Catholic, and it was written expressly for Roman Catholics, where it lays forth the responsibility shouldered by the Carroll family in establishing our seat of government, our national seat of government in the country, and what role John Carroll played. So Baltimore has always been a seat of Jesuit power in this country. And so where better for this national council of the Roman Catholic hierarchy to meet than in Baltimore, Maryland, the heart of Roman Catholic power in this country to respond to Pope Pius IX's encyclical and syllabus of error. They chose Baltimore, Maryland, and they met in October of 1866, only two years after the Pope's encyclical and syllabus were issued. Continuing now, it says it was supposed it was composed rather of seven archbishops and forty bishops, besides a number of the superiors of religious orders and was presided over by Archbishop Spalding, obviously a successor of John Carroll, 
It was presided over by Archbishop Spalding of Baltimore as the apostolic delegate. Now, this guy, as an apostolic delegate, is the very person of the Pope. He is the Pope's representative. And an apostolic delegate, when he says something, is to be as though the Pope spoke it. He speaks with the authority of the Pope. So we have, in a sense, the Pope attending this National Council of Roman Catholic Hierarchy in the United States in Baltimore, Maryland, in the person of Archbishop Spalding, the apostolic delegate. It says it was presided over by this Archbishop Spalding of Baltimore as the apostolic delegate representing the Pope and thus giving to the assembly as much weight and influence within its jurisdiction as if the Pope had been personally present. All right, so this is a big deal they're doing here in Baltimore. After all, they're, re they're, they're responding to the voice of their God who just damned our Republican form of government and wants a response from the Roman Catholic hierarchy in this country issued from the most powerful uh, city, Roman Catholic city in the nation, how they're going to respond to Pope Pius IX's demand that free governments be overturned. And it says, in theory, it represented the great body of the Roman Catholic lady in the United States, but practically it took no note of them or of their opinions. And anybody who knows anything about Roman Catholicism knows that the Roman Catholic laity have no say in the government of their church. They simply obey. But remember, they're in a Protestant nation. They have to make it look like the people have some say, because that's what this nation is all about, the people power. But it was a pretense. And who attended that, that council was not the laity of the Roman Catholic Church, but the Roman Catholic hierarchy. And it says it was assembled for a special work to respond to the encyclical and syllabus and it did it to the, quote, great comfort and consolation of the Pope, unquote. So this council responded affirmatively that, number one, they understood the very essence of the, of the, of the, of the encyclical and syllabus of error of Pope Pius IX, and they were going to comply with it. All right, it says, it would have been unnatural for him, that is the Pope, to have felt otherwise as great comfort and consolation, which we referred to. It would have been unnatural for him for, uh, to have felt otherwise at thus seeing the ranks of the papal army here in the United States closing up and at knowing how well he had succeeded in inaugurating a conflict between the imperial dogmas of the papacy and the fundamental principles of the American government. He's, he's starting a war. Pope Pius IX is starting a war between his form of government, hierarchical, dictatorial, and tyrannical, against our government, a government of, by, and for the people. In other words, he's putting into practice what he preached in his encyclical and syllabus of error. And the Roman Catholic hierarchy in this country are responding favorably to his demand that our government be overthrown and a Roman Catholic hierarchical government in its place. One that would respond first and foremost, or rather only, to the papacy. Now it says, in the pastoral letter issued by this council, the relation of the Roman Catholic Church to the government and laws of this country is discussed. Now obviously, that's the whole purpose of this council. Now, it says, there is a tone of ecclesiastical authority and command employed by its authors, which tends to show an impression existing in the minds that they were addressing an auditory not accustomed to question, 
their authority or controvert their propositions. In other words, the council expressed itself in the very way that it was demanded of them that they do express themselves. Authoritative. No room for debate. With ecclesiastical authority as though it were the voice of God, see? No debate about, about this. And it says, Hence they proceeded without indirection to lay it down as an axiom in the science of all governments not to be disputed that the civil power is never absolute and independent. So if you're going to overthrow this government, first you have to promote the idea that, that temporal governments, the civil governments of the world, can be resisted and should be resisted in certain circumstances. And they're going to lay that out, too. And it says, inasmuch as all power is from God, there must exist some delegated authority upon the earth which, representing God, must constitute the tribunal of last resort. Guess who that's going to be? The Pope, right? The court of last resort in the world, according to the papacy, is the papacy. And, it's a, and, and all civil governments must be resisted and disobeyed if they don't obey the Pope. And it says, upon this tribunal, that is the papacy, upon this tribunal alone, all absolute power is conferred, no matter what form of government. So the Pope is saying, I don't care what government kind of government you have, a republic, a democracy, whether you're communist or fascist, or a theocracy like there was in Japan, you must answer to the Pope. And it says, it, if it be a monarchy, as we know existed all throughout Europe, the Pope, after all, seated all the kings, that is, at least up until the Protestant Reformation. It says, if it be a monarchy, the king must be held in subjection to it, that is, the papal authority, and if a democracy, the people must be taught that it is above them. With this as the beginning point of their theory, substantially expressed, though not in these words, they declare that obedience to the civil power of the government, quote, is not a submission to force which may not be resisted, nor merely the compliance with a condition for peace and security, but a religious duty founded on obedience to God, by whose authority the civil magistrate exercises his power. Okay, so it's, it's, it's laid out. It's laid out for us. The civil power is not a power that cannot be resisted and should not be resisted on certain, under certain circumstances and that the power of the civil magistrate is subordinate and delegated power, they insist, and must always be exercised according to God's law. And you have to understand that coming from the papacy, that means it must be according to the Pope. And therefore, in prescribing anything contrary to that law, the civil power transcends its authority. In other words, it goes too far and has no claim to the obedience of the citizen because it never can be lawful to disobey God or as a necessary and logical result, those to whom, as custodian of his power on earth, he has delegated the divine right to govern. Founding their theory of government upon this idea, they proceed to show how differently the principle operates in the Catholic system and in the Protestant system. Now remember, we're talking about this council is going to discuss the difference between a Catholic form of government and a Protestant form of government that currently existed in the nation. It says, in the latter system, that is, the Protestant system, the system that was in place in the United States at that time, the people ruling, it says, in the letter, according to them, the individual is the ultimate judge of what the law of God commands and forbids. 
while in the former, that is the Roman Catholic system, the Catholic has a guide in the church as a divine institution which enables him to discriminate between what the law of God forbids or allows, so that when the church shall instruct him that any particular law of the state is contrary to God's law, he is thereby forbidden to pay obedience to it. All right, so the Protestants go get their brains and their Bibles, and they reason from the Scriptures how they should govern themselves according to God's law. That's not good enough for the Pope. Now, the Pope wants a hierarchical system where he is the replacement of God on earth, and he dictates. That's the difference between the Protestant system and the Roman Catholic system. And they acknowledge this in their response to Pope Pius IX. And it says, according to the Protestant system, in their opinion, the state is exposed to disorder and anarchy because the authority by which it is governed has no warrant for its character as divine. In other words, the Protestant system cannot, uh, uh, cannot claim a divine origin. Only the Pope can de declare, uh, can claim a divine origin. And it says the reverse, they insist, to be the case of the Catholic system. And therefore, because it has this divine authority in the church, and not in itself, the state is bound to recognize the Roman Catholic Church as the sole depository of the delegated power to decide what laws shall be obeyed and what laws disobeyed for the obvious reason that the world, in order to obey God, must recognize that church, the Roman Catholic Church, that is, the Pope and his hierarchy, quote, as supreme in its sphere of morals, no less than dogmatic teaching, unquote. So what we've just say, seen here is the very essence of the New World Order. And it's simply a mirror image or a continuation of the Old World Order that was overthrown by the Protestant Reformation. 1798, Berthier rode into the Vatican, took the papacy off his throne. He was no longer a papal king. He was no longer a, uh, a, a king commanding the, the kings of the earth, ruling over the kings of the earth. The Protestant Reformation was well underway, overthrowing the papal governments that ruled the nations. Men read their Bibles. They sat down and reasoned. They wanted religious liberty. They wanted to worship Christ and not Antichrist. And thus sprang up the government of the United States in its Protestant form of government. And the papacy wants to sit on his throne once again. And he's going to rely on the Roman Catholic hierarchy of the United States to get it done. And the Roman Catholic hierarchy in this country acquiesced and gave their assurance to the papacy that they would do all they could to overthrow our democratic or republican or protestant form of government and replace it with a hierarchical Roman Catholic government, and that's what's happening today. That is what's happening today. And if you can't see the changes that are being made in, in this country in that context, then I'm afraid you've misunderstood what's really happening in this world. This is the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Armson foresaw it back in the late 1800s, and you have the privilege of hearing it firsthand. We'll be right back after this. The Pope has established the moral obligation of the Roman Catholic hierarchy in this country to overthrow our Protestant form of government. He's made it a matter of moral dogma that you must overthrow this heretical government. It's a government of, by, and for the people. When the people should be ruled, they should not be the rulers that the Pope must have all the authority in the country, not a government seated by the people. The Pope is the one who seats the kings of the earth. 
That's the 2,000-year history of the Roman Catholic Church. The Pope seats the kings, and it's no different in the United States today as it was in Europe in the Dark Ages. When you go to the polls to vote for the President of the United States of America, you're voting among a field of people who have been picked by the Council on Foreign Relations, which, which is run by the Knights of Malta and high-level Freemasonry. They all work for the Jesuit general. The Jesuit general picks all the candidates for presidency, both Democratic and Republican. Okay, the Pope will not be put out of the political system of this country. And so when you go to the polls, you vote for one of two papal picks. They, you can pick whichever one you want, Democratic or Republican. He is sworn to obey the Pope. And if he doesn't obey the Pope, he's JFK'd. Okay? And this system of controlling our government was established right here at this Baltimore Council in direct response to Pope Pius IX's encyclical and syllabus of error, damning our form of government, calling it heretical, calling it a pestilential error, and making it a moral obligation of every Roman Catholic in this country to work to overthrow this government. And in the meantime, set up a shadow government called the bishoprics. This entire nation is covered with archdioceses and dioceses, bishoprics and archbishoprics, priests and prelates who oversee the civil government and its operations in this country and report to the papacy. And when any political person in this country, no matter what political office he holds, if he gets out of line, the local bishop goes into action, energizes the Roman Catholic shadow government, and they overthrow that administration and put someone in there that's friendly to the papacy. That's what the, the Knights of Columbus were all about, politics. You can't get elected in many places in this country unless you have the endorsement of the Knights of Columbus. The Knights of Malta handle national politics. They also handle the national press. They also handle the banking in this country. So if any renegade Protestant got uh, uh, an idea to run for high political office in this country, he'd come under a smear campaign like you wouldn't believe, and it would be splattered all over the mainstream media. They would, they would demonize him in any way necessary. And that's how the shadow government works in this country. A shadow government that was established in Baltimore, Maryland, the same place where this council is met to assure the Pope that they get it and they're going to overthrow this government no matter how long it takes. The only, the only caution they have to do is to make sure that they don't raise the suspicions of Protestants. It has to be done class, clandestinely, it has to be done gradually, and it has to be done effectively. And we're in the end game now. This is the end game. They're ready to overthrow the government. And, and they have largely already, if you've done any study on the Patriot Act and compare it with Roman Catholic canon law, they're twin sisters. All right? Your, your constitutional rights were just completely stripped when they passed the Patriot Act. And this is the Roman Catholic machine that's doing this. Now, the author continues, it requires no pause for reflection to see how directly a Roman Catholic form of government thus constructed would conflict with the existing civil institutions of the United States. Nor do we need a prophet to tell us that the establishment of such a system here would be followed by their immediate destruction. There's your Inquisition update. I mean, it sounds to me like R.W. Thompson even foresaw Inquisition in this country. Listen to what he says. We don't need a prophet to tell us that the establishment of a Roman Catholic system here in the United States would be immediately followed by the destruction of Protestants. That's what he's saying. And he said to permit a church, any church, and I will add the words particularly the Roman Catholic Church, 
to decide upon the validity or invalidity of our laws after their enactment or to dictate beforehand, as they do in Washington, D.C. today, what laws should be and should not be passed would be to deprive the people of all the authority they have retained in their own hands and to make such a church the governing power instead of them. How prophetic is this book? That's just exactly what has happened. He continues, he said, Yet understanding this perfectly well, and evidently contemplating the time when they might possibly be able to bring about this condition of affairs, that is, the replacement of our government by a Roman Catholic government, these papal representatives there met in Baltimore directly assail a principle which has been universal in all our state governments from their very foundation, that which regulates by law the holding of real estate by churches and other corporations and requires them to conform in this temporal matter to the statute laws of the states. To this there could be no reasonable or just objection had they invoked the rightful power to change, alter, amend, or even to abrogate the, the obnoxious laws, for this would have been only the exercise of the admitted right of free discussion, secured as well to them as to others. But they manifestly had no such idea in view inasmuch as, according to them, that method of procedure belongs to the Protestant and not to the Catholic system of government. To exclude the impression that they designed to look to any other authority than that of the papacy for the relief they seek, they take a special pains to say that they are, quote, are not as yet permitted legally to make those arrangements for the security of church property which are in accordance with the canons and discipline of the Roman Catholic Church, unquote. That is, that the canons and discipline of their church, issued from the Vatican at Rome by the Pope and the Roman Curia, are not permitted to override or nullify the laws of the states. The plain import of this is, that all the laws of the states concerning the rights of the Roman Catholic Church and regulating the manner in which it all, sh it, it, excuse me, in regulating the manner which it shall hold and enjoy property have no claim on the obedience of the Roman Catholic citizen because they are not in accordance with the canons and disciplines of the Roman Catholic Church and the papal decrees. Such a system of government put into practice, in practical operation, would amount to this, that conformity to the canons and disciplines of the Roman Catholic Church would be the test of all laws, and none would be binding except those pronounced obligatory by the Pope. The divine right of the Pope to govern the people through his hierarchy would be fully recognized, and the right of self-government would be at an end." So there you have it. We have one example where the papacy insists that it not be bound by the civil laws of this government, particularly where it pertains to the property owned by the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church has subsisted and has grown to incalculable power and wealth based on a system of works. That is, by indulgences and by penances, the laity of the Roman Catholic Church can win absolution for their sins. And in order to do that, they buy indulgences and they pay penance to the Roman Catholic Church in the form of land and gold and real estate and property. And the Roman Catholic Church, at the height of the zenith of the papal power, owned the majority of the land of Europe and left the nations poor, left the people poor. And the papacy wants that same assurance of freedom 
to acquire wealth and property and real estate and financial power in, and political power in this country. Look, the landowner is always the power broker in politics. Rome has a destiny for the United States, and it requires the United States to be controlled by the papacy in order to fulfill that destiny. In order to empower the Roman Catholic Church to fulfill that destiny, they must have the, the, the clean ownership of property. That the civil governments cannot place regulations upon how, how much property the Roman Catholic Church can own or how that property can be used. It cannot molest that which is owned by the papacy. So if you stop and think about it, the demands that the Roman Catholic Church made on our government and has ever since the founding of this country is that every piece of real estate, every piece of land owned by the Roman Catholic Church becomes an enclave the civil power has no authority over it. Do you know the threshold of a Roman Catholic Church cannot be broached by a police officer unless he inv he's invited by the ambassador of the Pope, local priest? It's an asylum. And that's the way the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy in particular, wants all of its property viewed by the civil power as an autonomous, um, sovereign enclave of the papacy that cannot be touched by the civil power. The civil power must answer to the Pope, and if the Pope says you stay off my property, then the civil power must obey. And that's the guarantee that the papacy demands of the Roman Catholic hierarchy to achieve in our government, sovereignty of Roman Catholic property and the freedom to acquire and amass as much real estate and land and gold and riches as can possibly be gained so that the Roman Catholic Church can be unstoppable in political power in this country to achieve its ultimate goal, complete conquest and overthrow the government. You see how this works? This is why it's so important that the Roman Catholic hierarchy accept the Pope and his papal infallibility, that they view him as God on the earth, and that they answer him, they obey him implicitly and without question. Because the accomplishment of their goal is ultimately supreme of importance. And it can't be done if people are allowed to think for themselves, and especially not if they read the Bible, and especially not if they defend a heretical Protestant government based on the people and not the Pope. I hope all this is coming together for you. The people that have never heard these things, it's a bit complicated, but it's really very simple. The Pope's literally saying, who are you going to serve, me or God? That's what it really boils down to. Choose you this day who you will serve. Are you going to serve me, or are you going to serve the Creator? The two can't exist together. Even the Father said in the book, He that is not with me is against me. It's black and white. And the papacy is black. And this book proves it. Now he continues, he said, The right of holding real estate and accumulating large wealth after the manner of the Roman Catholic Church and the monastic orders of Europe, the American hierarchy regard as of so much importance to the success of their ecclesiastical organization that this Baltimore Council declared that to withhold it is to, pro is to deprive their church quote, listen to this, of a necessary means of promoting the end for which she has been established, unquote. The Roman Catholic Church was established in this country to promote a necessary end for the papacy.
That is total domination. And it can't do it if the, if the civil power can molest or confiscate the church's property and strike a blow at the very power base of the papacy here in America. He said they declare that, she, that, quote, she, that is the Roman Catholic Church, cannot accept the principles upon which American laws are based without departing from her practice from the beginning. Because they are the, ex, the expression of a distrust of ecclesiastical power. In other words, the Protestant government of this country is in rebellion against the ecclesiastical power of the Roman Catholic Church. They're inherently incompatible. If the papal system is going to succeed in this country, the Protestant system has to be destroyed. And it says, and to leave no doubt whatsoever about their meaning, they insist that the states have no more right to impose on their church, the Roman Catholic Church, a system of holding her temporalities which is alien to her principles, that is, the Roman Catholic Church principles, then they have to prescribe to her the doctrines that she teaches. And they solemnly enter into their formal protest against all such legislation, notwithstanding the laws they protest against exist in all the states and embody a principle deliberately con uh, considered and approved by the American people. It is incompatible, they say, with the full measure of ecclesiastical or religious liberty to deprive them of the right of holding whatsoever amount of real or other property they may acquire in the United States by purchase, by device or gift, and of governing it by the laws of the popes or their own enact of uh, or their own enacting independently of the laws of the state to which all Protestant churches and people pay cheerful obedience, thus showing that they would, eat, uh, they would have each archbishop within his episcopate and each bishop within his diocese and each priest within his parish a temporal prince with a scepter of royalty in his hand, although he might not wear its crown upon his head. In other words, the demands that the Roman Catholic Church is making upon our government regarding the real estate and property holdings of the Roman Catholic Church makes every Roman Catholic hierarch in this country a local prince. Do you understand what I'm saying? That each bishop being a representative of the Pope and an agent of the Pope is a local landholder for the Pope. And he's untouchable, both he and the property of the Roman Catholic Church that he oversees and controls, is untouchable by the civil power. You remember I was talking about the, the, each piece of property of the, of the Roman Catholic Church being a sovereign papal enclave in this country? completely independent of the United States and untouchable by its government or its laws. That's what he just said. That each archbishop, each bishop, each priest of the Roman Catholic Church is a temporal prince. And nobody has more power than a temporal prince except his king. And who is his king? The Pope. You know, the uh, Bible describes Jesus Christ as the Prince, the Prince of Peace. And no one has any authority over that Prince but the Father only. So take it for what it says. Under the Roman Catholic system, every Roman Catholic hierarch in this country, right down to the local parish priest, would be a temporal prince of the Pope, not answerable to any civil law, untouchable by the people or by the government. Now is the concept of a shadow government 
becoming more tangible in your mind? That the Roman Catholic Church is indeed a, a tangible, visible, although hidden in plain sight, shadow government. It's a nation within a nation. It's a sovereign nation within a sovereign nation. The one nation answers to the people of this country. The other nation answers to no one but the Pope. Now, it says, one would expect to see in a document of this kind a statement of some serious grievance against which relief was sought, something that would at least excuse, if not justify, the attempt to introduce into our government a foreign element of authority above the people. But the only practical results complained of here are, first, the taxation of the Roman Catholic Church property, and second, an attempt made by the state of Missouri after the end of the rebellion, that is the Civil War, quote, to make the exercise of the ecclesiastical ministry depend upon a condition laid down by the civil power. In other words, Missouri wanted to make the Roman Catholic Church answer to the civil power. Missouri knew what position the Roman Catholic Church would attempt to take in this country, as did the Founding Fathers, who gave us the First Amendment, that Rome would eventually, if she got control of this country or the various states, would overthrow the, the, the governments, the state governments and the federal government. And they wanted the Roman Catholic Church to, to answer to the Missouri state government. They wanted to hold the Roman Catholic Church down in power. Missouri got it said the state of Missouri after the end of the Civil War to make the exercise of the ecclesiastical ministry. What is the exercise of the ecclesiastical ministry? To impose Roman Catholic canon law and to usurp supremacy in the nation. They wanted to make the exercise of the Roman Catholic ecclesiastical ministry depend upon a condition laid down by the civil power that is, by requiring them to conform to the laws of the state in furnishing evidence of their loyalty to the government. Missouri wanted the right to, to tax the Roman Catholic Church, to, to remind her every day she pays taxes that she does not have sovereign power in this country, at least not over the government of Missouri. Missouri got it. Missouri understood what Rome was all about. Now, it says, from the nature of these complaints, it would seem that they were only employed as a pretext, merely affording them an opportunity of making known to the Pope how cheerfully they responded to the doctrines of his encyclical and syllabus of error, and with what confidence he might rely upon them in doing their share of the work necessary to arrest the progress and the advancement upon which this country had entered self-government. It has to be destroyed. And the Baltimore Council confirmed, yes, Lord God, Pope, we get it, and we know that you are the only divine right ruler in the world, and this is a heretical government of, by, and for the people. It must be overthrown, and we're going to help do it. That's what happened at the Baltimore Council. Now, Roman Catholics today tell me Pope Pius IX is kind of you know, discredited by Roman Catholics in this country. Oh, no. That's what they tell the Protestants. But look what's happening in Washington, D.C., in the context of what R.W. Thompson is telling us in this book. They just don't want to upset the, the Protestants. They're fearful of a Protestant Reformation in America. We'll talk about it more on the program tomorrow. Thanks for listening.